because of the practices that we've developed, that we've (coughs) devoted um, attention and effort to, for many of us over, over years, the practices of mindfulness and the refinement of attention, of the uh, awareness of and skill with the energy body and the emotional awareness, um, insights into emptiness, non spectrum of fabrication, dwelling in states of less fabrication, etc., all that. Um, because of the the practice with regard to that and the accumulation of, of those uh, skills and arts, the diligence there, um, we are well equipped for this investigation that we're unfolding. We have um, the tools and the uh, refinement of discernment uh, necessary to really open it up and make it fertile. <clears throat> and all that comes as a result of practice f- for many people. Um, and at the same time, uh, being as many of us are used to a certain uh, range of teaching and concept and direction within within a tradition, um, one can very easily, as I said, uh, doubts can arise very easily. And so very commonly someone who's had quite a bit of practice, let's say in a more uh, narrow tradition of insight meditation was it isn't this just feeding the kilesas, the defilements? Isn't this all this what you're talking about, Eros and being with Eros and opening up, isn't it just feeding the defilements, greed, aversion and delusion? So again, can can we actually take that doubt deeper and make it uh, fertile, not paralyzing, but fertile, dynamic, make it into a real question and look, notice, find out, <clears throat> so that <clears throat> we see that Eros, in the way that we are talking about it, and practicing with Eros, has a quality, it opens, um, it, uh, it, 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 uh, supports opening, opening of what? Opening of the energy body. You can you can feel this. It needs a certain sensitivity, but you can feel this. With Eros, the energy body tends to opening. Cosmopoesis, the, the, the perception of the world, tends to opening, and if you like, deepening. The sense of dimensionality opens. The senses of sacredness and divinity also are opened. So Eros brings with it, supports, instigates opening uh, of all kinds, uh, beautiful openings. Um, And actually, in the way that we are talking about it, because of the imaginal is involved and wrapped up in what we're calling Eros, then it doesn't uh, bring this... um, pressure to act out because there's there isn't the movement necessarily at all to concretizing to simple concretizing i have a desire for x therefore i must get x therefore i act to get x there's all the imaginal dimensions that opening out there uh, instead <clears throat> usually and uh, there's also Eros uh, tends to uh, relieve Dukkha. Eros tends to relieve Dukkha, although there is the pothos, this wanting more. So there's not complete peace there. And there is the, um, the erotic tension that we talked about, etc. But in practice and in life, we can see this um, tendency of Eros to open things up in a beautiful way, to relieve Dukkha, and and away from a sort of simplistic um, uh, concretizing or being tied in to acting out this or that just because I desire it. Craving, on the other hand, is opposite to all of that. It tends to close, close the energy body. You can feel it, you can notice it, you can be sensitive to it. It does not open the cosmopoiesis, it does not open a sense of dimensionality, it does not open a sense of sacredness, divinity. It tends towards concretizing and a sort of pressure of the impetus to act out, and it brings dukkha. Uh, and 
we can see that again, both in the meditation practice in, and, and in our life. So it's possible <clears throat> to discern between eros and craving in, the, in those ways and, and in others. It's quite possible to make this discernment, make these discernments. And it's not always easy and not always simple to discern between the two. Can we dare to experiment? Can we dare to question? Because this is how we're going to really find out and develop our uh, uh, discerning chops, if you like, our, our capabilities, our, the refinement of our discerning. It takes a certain daring to question the, these things, to open up these questions, to experiment and find out for ourselves. Is it the uh, SAS, the British Special Forces? Uh, they have their their motto, who dares wins. I think I think I think it's them. Who dares wins. Sometimes, actually often in practice, uh, when we talk about more radical um, practice, whether it's emptiness or this or, or that at some edge, um, who dares wins means there's a certain daring, a certain boldness in venturing into the unknown to find out for oneself. And sometimes, as I said, it's not always easy to discern between eros and craving, for example. Sometimes some, we, we think this is eros, and then it gets all tangled, and we feel, oh, well, the, the energy body is contracting, there is a contraction, there is dukkha. But even the entanglement there, or the tangling of eros and craving together, the two threads tangled, um, doesn't necessarily mean immediately throw the whole thing out. This is quite important. There's a parallel here, for example, <clears throat> for anyone who's ever d- devoted some time and uh, some dedicated practice to developing um, samatha or samadhi. Um, and often, you know, if if you make that uh, intention in practice over whatever it is, however long, on retreat, off retreat, you will uh, all absolutely inevitably encounter this question of um, it's moving towards something. There's something I desire here. I desire to open up these states of, of samadhi. I desire to discover them, to master them, enter them, whatever. And in that, I, 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 I meet, I, enc- I encounter the question of effort. I, n- I need to make effort. There's the desire involved. We talked about the Buddha and his um, four bases of success. Uh, his list there, and and I encounter sometimes too much effort, too little effort, too tight effort. So there's going to be dukkha. It gets too tight, the effort towards the samadhi, and here's dukkha. And how many people? What percentage of people in the insight meditation world think, ah, oh, it's just painful. Forget it. Forget it. This is ego. This is striving. Pick up some other teaching that says, oh. You know, just let it all be. Don't don't try and make anything happen or something. And the whole thing, baby gets thrown out with the bathwater, basically. So, uh, and that's a mistake. Rather, in relation to samatha, it would be a mistake. Rather, can I learn about wise effort? Can I learn about having aspirations and goals and things that I yearn to move towards and to know and experience myself in in meditation in spiritual life, in, in life in general, and learn how to handle that, how to relate to it wisely, without either just getting completely um, entangled and, and uh, in pain around that, or throwing the whole thing out and not getting anywhere. Not really developing uh, mastery of, of samadhi, etc. So just the arising of suffering or contraction, if we're working in this area with eros, uh, etc., doesn't, uh, you know, I wouldn't just use that as a criterion of discernment between eros and craving. The two can get mixed, and our relationship with the whole thing can get fraught, and, and sometimes it gets a little tight. Remember I was telling you about the uh, those Upandita retreats, etc., uh, where where actually there's quite a lot of suffering in the service of something. So just because we meet a bit of tightness or entanglement or confusion doesn't mean we drop it and throw it out. It's, it's actually asking for more subtlety, more artistry in the discernment, in the balancing, in the responding. Okay. 
as I mentioned, you know, we can start with eros, all very beautiful, and and there's the fullness of the imagination, and everything, and something happens, and it contracts until it gets diverted, perverted into craving, and vice versa. We start with what's obviously a state of craving and the contraction of craving and limited seeing. And actually, with skillful, artful working, we can um, re-guide that uh, and navigate to open that uh, into into the, the beauty and the fullness of Eros. So there's art here, there's skill, there's, it takes care uh, in, in the discernment between the two and in the navigation if, if it is from craving to eros, but certainly in the discernment, uh, there's art, there's skill, there's care, and these sensitivities asking for quite a um, refined and, if you like, sophisticated kind of discernment. <clears throat> but we develop that, it's really possible. And one of the aspects, I said that, as I said, that can help us discern is. is the, the uh, sensitivity to the soul-making dynamic and what is happening with that soul-making dynamic, mean, meaning the um, mutual insemination, fertilization, ignition, widening, deepening, complicating, enriching of the eros psyche logos uh, uh, dynamic constellation. So this, this tells us that we're on the right track and you can get sensitive to the different excuse me, aspects of that when it's, uh, when it's moving, when it's, when it's uh, in progress. So with, for example, with a, uh, if we talk specifically a, 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 a sexual image now, as I said, uh, we can notice um, the specificity of the image and the kind of iconic quality of the sexual image, if that's what we're working with. It doesn't tend mostly to to want to escalate the next thing, the next thing, and then uh, now I need to have an orgasm, or now I need to release some steam, or uh, whatever, or the next thing until it goes towards, you know, whatever it is, uh, genital intercourse or whatever. Um, there's uh, this specificity of the image. It's it's sufficient to itself. I think was the phrase I used. There's an iconic quality. It's not really going anywhere except deeper into dimensionality and divinity and, and beauty. Yes, it's not going anywhere in, in, a, in a kind of narrative accomplishment sense. The pothos there, the desire for more, that goes with the eros that we talked about, tends to go um, to, to find, to discover and create more in the dimensionality, in, in the multifacetedness of the beloved other and of the self, etc., as we said in the cosmopoesis, it doesn't tend to seek its more in the in the acquisitiveness of of greed, uh, spreading uh, one dimensionally. I have one car now; I need three. I have one uh, lover, wife, husband, whatever it is, and now I need another sexual partner because somehow they're not interesting to me enough. Because I don't, I don't, I'm not opening to their dimensionality. So then the more needs to go out sideways to the one dimensionality. So we can recognize this difference. And actually, as I said, we can write it, if you like. We can um, guide it. If it feels like it's getting uh, diverted, contracted, craving it can be it can, there's, there's ways of seeing ways of approaching it that that re, redirect it uh, back on the track of eros so yes it's absolutely possible that some uses of the Im imagination the imaginary and fantasy in the usual sense of the word um, are are not what we call imaginal so piaget was a, a very um, well respected child psychologist um, very influential when years you know, thirty years ago I can't remember when I was a undergraduate, um, <clears throat> and uh, he uh, in his sort of developmental psychology you know he he said Chil the imaginal well, the imaginary others of children I don't think he made that distinction children's imaginary others are immature and egocentric creations designed for wish fulfillment so that was all he could see. In, in children's um, use of the imagination. 
uh, or it was helpful in planning and learning con and conceptual structures, etc. But but really, um, is that always the case? And 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 it's clear with a little more careful looking, a little less biased looking that that's absolutely not the case. That's why we make distinction with this word imaginal versus imaginary or certainly just the use of the imagination. So he was enormously influential. I don't know if he still is, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, and, and one wonders also what was influencing him, because already by that time the imagination had uh, been severely demoted in um, Western, uh, Western, uh, the Western worldview and psychology. But that's not what he was referring to, certainly uh, not the whole picture, and, and not what we mean by imaginal and fantasy. And you can, you can tell, is it, is it wish fulfillment? As we said, you can tell sometimes uh, in, in the sense of the autonomy of the image. And some people might want to discern because they sense uh, between, let's say, the imaginal and the imaginary eros and craving, because they sense the autonomy of the imaginal other. And that, that it has a kind of independence and intelligence and can actually surprise us. Actually, its actions or what it says or uh, what it does in relation to us surprise us. And I could give so many examples of this, but just one's come to mind now is that actually there was much more to this image um, that may be relevant to other points that we want to make later. But, um, but I just want to share right now just this kind of moment really in an in, in image uh, because it's significant is relevant to what I'm saying right now, the point I want to make right now. Working in practice with this beautiful, erotic, imaginal meditation, and, um, and there was something at the same, uh, something, um, I don't know how to say, in the, in the wider politics of the Dharma world that had upset me, and also had affected me directly, but it was sort of um, really a, a much wider issue. And so, I was kind of disturbed by that, and I could feel that I really wanted to kind of go in, into that and um, dwell with it and not really engage this erotic imaginal uh, meditation there. And uh, um, the uh, beautiful, in this case, was a beautiful woman that, that was in the meditation there, at some point um, took my hands and put them into uh, the, the the prayer mudra, uh, Anjali. It's not called Anjali, but I can't remember what the name of it. The prayer mudra, you know, you know with the palms pressed together. And uh, she, she took my hands, put them in that posture, and then um, uh, mirrored that gesture herself with our fingertips touching, uh, as if to communicate, you know, to just just forget about that right now. We have this beautiful devotion to dwell on, to um, feed on, to attend to between us, and uh, that really wasn't kind of what I wanted to, to dwell on at that point. Another part of me was kind of really wanting to figure out this bigger situation and upset and wanting uh, to kind of get into that. Um, so there was a kind of autonomy there, and her intelligence, and of course it was the intelligent thing to do, there was a deeper wisdom there. Um, but we get the sense, so I could give so many examples of this, is it really my wish, as I asked the other day, is it really my wish fulfillment um, that's happening in in uh, the erot with the erotic imaginal, Here are countless examples of that possible. Um, uh, so some people may want to use the um, the sense of the autonomy of the imaginal other as an indication. Uh, it that's good, but I would be a little cautious there. And I know, for instance, James Hillman w would really strongly spoke up against any kind of ego involvement uh, with the imaginal. So that if the ego decides to do this or the, or that, uh, he was very suspicious of that. I would. Um, 
I'd like to question that, actually. So for me, it's fine if it feels like your ego is initiating something in the relationship there, in the imaginal relationship, or initiating an image or whatever. Um, that is not necessarily a problem. The test is whether it feels soul-making. So I've said this before, but it's really, really important. The test is is you can actually feel the soul making in all the ways that we've talked about in the past <coughs> on the other retreats um, and, and that I would rather uh, be the guide rather than was that my ego? Did I just make that happen? D- don't worry about that it's fine, it's fine if you did, it's fine if you didn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, get too caught up in that as a criterion, but you can test uh, rather you can tell if, if, if the um, the erotic imaginal feels like it's soul making it's very clear in the beauty there, in the devotion, in the divinity, in the dimensionality, all of that. So we get sometimes a little unclear um, what's a problem here uh, in, in our doubt. It causes some confusion. What's a potential problem? Uh, and so, for instance, as we already touched on, you know, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, something that happens with an image or an image itself. Um, or an erotic relationship with him is really intense or just really weird compared to what other people seem to be speaking about or what we know from uh, what the culture feeds us. And very easily a person can think, I'm nuts, I'm crazy, or if I'm not crazy already, this is this is taking me towards craziness, I'm going crazy, if I follow this, I'll go crazy. Uh, and, and this is the voice of fear, and the voice of the indoctrination from the cultures that we move in. Um, that, as I said, it, the, the imaginal has no place, it's not given a place in the culture. We have a suspicion, unless it's quite contained, uh, you know, making movies or writing sci-fi novels, or whatever it is, you know. Um, and so so it's understandable that, that there is fear in relation to this. We are we have been actually for centuries and centuries kind of indoctrinated, um, dogmatized, if that's a, a word, um, uh, to, to be afraid. Because it doesn't have a place, and there's all kinds of... It's not given a place, it's not given respect, validity, purpose... In, in our sense of our existence, of what healthy psychology is, of, of the spiritual paths, etc. So there's all kinds of cultural assumptions coming in there, in, in that kind of doubt. I'm going crazy, this is too intense, this is too weird. So what we're doing here, partly, is really um, trying to support, trying to move towards giving the imaginal and the erotic imaginal a place a meaningful place and purpose in a conceptual framework that's coherent, that really serves something, and th- and and to come into relationship with these images, wise relation, not just drop them and turn away, not just indulge without any sensitivity in a kind of imaginary, uh, wish-fulfilling, daydreaming thing, seeking pleasure. S- through the the concepts that we're talking about through the path that we're um, delineating and filling out and through the sensitivity and the artfulness of the, of the living relationships here, uh, living erotic imaginal relationships, uh, we, want to, we want to move it towards all that and the fullness of all that. And as I also said, this, this, you know, we want to also give place to and respect to and... Um, trust, if you like, to to what seems like the darker or more intense um, sexual images that come up and, and eros that comes up. Have a look. You know, is it disrespectful? Don't jump jump so quickly to conclusions. Is this disrespectful? If I want to devour you and uh, uh, drink your holy blood and, and lick your bones and eat your organs... Is that really kind of? Is that a sadism? Is that kind of some pathological cannibalism? Is it because I'm angry? Is it? Uh, is it without love? So easy to assume all this stuff. It's like actually have a look, feel, feel what's there. Is it an objectification? To me, objectification means I don't see uh, and value the totality of the other's being. 
being of the other. I don't see and value um, all that they include. And, and, and bringing them down to one dimension, one dimensional, one purpose. Whether it's an actual person, whether it's a purely imaginal figure. Um, is that the case? Or we can also objectify it because I just see them from me. And that includes a kind of spiritual, psychological objectification. I just see this imaginal figure, or this person, this teacher, or this whatever it is, or this partner. They just exist. I've kind of shrunk down my seeing them. They just exist for my growth, for my psycho-spiritual process. And we tend to see imaginal figures that way. Oh yes, I'm developing my faculty of X, Y, Z through this imaginal figure. That's an objectification. Or I don't see, as I said there, uh, I don't see and value their totality. Is it objectification? And if it is, what do I need to do to let it fill out? Is it out of control? People often go, oh, this, this, this will take me out of control, or this is out of, out of control. Is it? Maybe, maybe a little bit at, at one level, but that's just the nature of things. But really, one can get up and walk away, or there's so much in the art of navigation and steering that we've talked about. So right there in in what for many would uh, be kind of taboo uh, sexual erotic images and interactions, frowned upon, regarded as weird or pathological, right there we can actually sense uh, a holiness, a sense of sacredness, divinity, feel it. Or someone might have the opposite doubt. Oh, this isn't intense at all. And so and so uh, shared such a weird image. It was really far out and incredibly dramatic and colourful. And mine are just kind of ordinary. So it's not working for me, or it can't be very deep. Uh, again, don't, you know, don't don't jump to such conclusions. Um, eros includes a you know great range from very very subtle to to intense uh, and and the same with with the imaginal you know can be very ordinary or or very strange you know intensity does not necessarily translate to potency and it's potency we're interested in intensity can just be right then that experience feels intense and it's like wow now i have to tell the teacher or i have to tell my friends or or I get worried, or whatever it is, and then and then maybe you know half an hour later, or whatever, a few days later, it's like nothing came of it. Maybe other times something's not intense at all, and actually because we're relating to it wisely and skillfully, and with the art and with the discernment and the, and the, and the beauty of that navigation, the subtlety of that, actually what was not intense can be very potent long term. Or someone has the doubt. Oh, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't really get any images, uh, and I've been through this on on the other retreats. You know, so really, really look. Um, you might not get any visual images, but images can come in, in the way we're using it. Um, uh, that word it doesn't just mean visual at all. It might not be anything visual involved at all. It involves any any of the senses. Okay said that before. And also, you know, um, our life is full of fantasies and images in the sense that I'm u- u- using that word. Look where you love. Pay attention where you love, where there's a sense of meaningfulness in your life. There is the operation right there. Somehow involved in that is the is the, the movement and the operation, the, the saturation of images and fantasies in the good sense that I'm talking about. Where you love, where things are meaningful, where something is meaningful. But I've been 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 through all, all that before. What's more a problem is, as I also said, is reification, um, meaning identification with 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 an image, a sort of rigidification of the sense of self, a concretization of the sense of self. <coughs> Um, a realism of the image or of the self. Um, Jung's word inflation is perhaps misleading. Um, I think, and would he cautioned about inflation with respect to 
um, images, etc. I think um, what he really meant, as far as I understood, is is more, uh, or it would be better to have said that the problem is identification. Well, maybe maybe he had a mixed thing in his his message, but I would I would like to say actually that uh, the problem is really, as I said, reification, identification, realism, um, concretization, literalism. Um, it's not a problem uh, if to the undiscerning mind an image seems grandiose. Often as we think, oh, I can't possibly attain that kind of image. Sometimes they're beautiful images, images of service, and someone goes, oh, that's too grandiose to, that's me in some Mother Teresa fantasy or whatever. Um, or if an image seems ungrounded because it's very light and insubstantial and involves a kind of, perhaps a kind of flying or all, all kinds of things. Or if it's weird, as I said, or pathological, if it's not politically correct or psychologically correct. For instance, if it's if it's a sexual thing and it involves some kind of domination or submission, that kind of thing. Oh, that's that's uh, that's not psychologically correct. It's not politically correct. This or that. Um, the undiscerning mind can be too quick to jump in here with certain prepackaged psychological truths about what it's suspicious about, what it's afraid of. But rather, the problem is realism, uh, reification, identification. And um, it's a problem if, as we said, there's not a kind of equality and pervasiveness of seeing image as image, of seeing the emptiness of everything. So self, other, world, eros itself, body. All this must be seen uh, if, if it's lopsided where we see image as image and where we don't, where the soul-making is able to open up the dimensions and where it isn't. That also can be problematic, as we've, as we've talked about. Or if there's a rigidity, uh, so we talked about, for example, the image of or the ideal of, of being a passionate person or being an equanimous person, equanimous person and the, the image and idealization that's kind of wrapped up in that has can have a kind of um, a, it can actually be a kind of attachment. There's a, there's a an attachment to uh, uh, to an image um, of of what eros looks like, passionate like this, or what, for example. There's a rigidity there to the image. So all these are more the problem. So as I said, I think. Um, Certainly, on on the reenchanting the cosmos retreat, you know, I'm interested in a path that actually really has an understanding of emptiness as a basis for the whole path. Understanding the emptiness of everything, without without exception. That what happens when that is placed as a basis of the path, not just emptiness as sort of something we add on as an advanced thing or something that's an option or. And, and not an emptiness, an understanding of emptiness that leaves some things tacitly not empty. The process, or the time, or the awareness, or the things as they are, or whatever it is. So a basis in emptiness uh, lies at, 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 at the fundament of all this. There's a basis of emptiness, not a truth claim, not some or other truth claim. It's quite a different orientation you could say, not so interested in building on reality claims, what is reality, but rather on efficacy or potency. If we look this way, if we conceive this way, what happens? If we conceive in this slightly different way, what happens? What is the effect efficacy, what is potent there in terms of what it opens for the being, for the vision for the sense of existence, for the life and what happens when we conceive only that way, or look only that way so efficacy and potency um, rather than reality as criteria for how we move here and what we kind of base our judgments and discernments on and this, I know, is, is difficult sometimes, this idea of um, it's not real. 
how do I trust something that's not real? Uh, and if it's not real, or if I'm supposed to question, is it real? Is it not real? And, and if I if I have this um, qu- unsureness there about understanding the real, not real sort of uh, middle way, uh, a lot of doubt can can ha- can uh, come up with that. So an understanding of emptiness really opens a tremendous amount of possibility. It gives a basis of legitimacy to all kinds of um, beautiful and exciting uh, uh, soul-making avenues for us. And so doubt can, when we really understand the emptiness of of all this, the doubt can really subside. But some people may be not quite ready for that. So I appreciate that. I also think... um, a, that this can be developed. We can really develop this um, this kind of uh, stance and understanding that is a kind of middle way between real and not real, a kind of imaginal version of the, or version of the middle way related to the imaginal, <coughs> um, between existence and non-existence. But that's developable. We can, we can really develop that um, as we're going with these kind of, practices or in parallel through emptiness meditation or just through the imaginal itself. Um, so in terms of the emptiness uh, understanding, oftentimes there's there's some degree of insight into emptiness that a person can draw on. So for example, someone has, maybe they haven't done the whole emptiness thing and, and really seen the emptiness of everything, well, that, that's actually pretty rare, Um, but they've done enough to see, you know, some degree of the emptiness of self, Uh, and to a certain level, and and it's like, right there, they can draw on that, on that um, parallel insight, because they see some degree of the emptiness of self, and yet they don't dismiss the self, they don't um, spit at it or ignore it, they have respect for their self and for other selves. Um, and they have care for the self, uh, for selves, and and they perceive selves, knowing that they're empty. They have that insight, but they perceive them and they relate to them. And sometimes they drop that perception, etc. Knowing that they're empty, they can perceive, relate to, care for uh, the self. Yes. So that's a level of this seeing that something isn't real, and yet. Um, entering into relationship with it, a relationship of respect and interaction and taking seriously, caring. And similar with the imaginal. So if you think, oh, I, I don't know how to do that, maybe draw on some level of the insight into emptiness that you already have integrated, already. And you, you see, emptiness does not mean... Um, I need to completely reject something or I never perceive it or I never respect it. It's the freedom to to move. Uh, When we see the emptiness of something, it opens up a freedom of choice, of ways of looking. So yes, I can see through this thing and kind of not give it attention or, uh, or I can give it attention. I'm free. The emptiness makes me free either way. Yeah? And I can, as I said, relate to it Knowing that it's empty, but still respecting and caring. Same, same with images. And I, I would, my experience teaching this is also that someone can have very little understanding of emptiness uh, from their previous practice, and there's somehow a sense for them that they can notice in working with the imaginal that it is, as, as I think I said uh, the other day, it's it it has this kind of theatre quality to it. Um, it's both, it's definitely not real. It has a different kind of quality in the way that I'm seeing this self in interaction, the way that I'm seeing this other, is got this quality to it that's as if theatre. Um, it's not real, but there is a kind of reality to it. It's somewhere uh, there, but I'm uh, in between there, but if you like, in a middle way, but I'm not um, just relating to this self's process then, the image of the self undergoing this process and in this relationship, um, imaginal relationship, as just real. Or what I see of this self is just, it's a reality there. There's a there's an element, uh, a rather feel, a quality of theatre to it. 
and I'm not sure whether that word theater is related to the word theos uh, for divinity. But that sense, even without um, practice and emptiness, sometimes sometimes you can actually get that sense of, oh yeah, that feels different. Even in using, opening to the imagination in regard to some kind of psychological work on the self, for example, I was talking the other day with someone working with the inner child, um, that whole kind of work in in, in therapy, which um, was popular some years ago, or certain other ways of working where the imagination is allowed. This is some Ridwan uh, inquiries, etc. And there's the imagination at work there, and very skillfully used, very beautiful. But the self um, inquiring, the self looking at that imagination regards it as real. This is a real aspect of self. It it doesn't have the quality of theatre to it. So imagine it's something different. And we can notice when it's one and when it's the other. Even if I don't know anything about emptiness, it's got it's got a different um, quality to it. The quality of theatre, the quality of not being real, yet still being really potent and really beautiful and really moving and really transformative. <clears throat> and uh, again, something I mentioned before, but so important to say it again, you know, that the the big picture, the conceptual framework, will help with our sort of m- doubt. In, in the big sense, but also in terms of micro-choices, moment-to-moment choices in practice. Yeah. So that's really, uh, to me, is re- really um, quite, quite important there. To have that sense as much as we can, to build the big picture, the conceptual framework. How, how does this all work? How does it fit together? Where are we going? What does this mean as opposed to that, etc.? It really informs our choices. But all this is really um, an art. I, I like to think of it as an art, um, which means, and for me, art involves con- one element, and one aspect of art is, is there is a conceptual, conceptual framework involved. No matter uh, who, who you think you are, free jazz, I'm going out of tonality and out of you know, rhythms, it's, it's still, it's, sorry, there's still conce- plenty of conceptual framework, Jackson Pollock, whatever it is, there's a, there's a conceptual framework there. And, if it's R, it involves a conceptual framework, and the intuition, the, the following of hunches that are, uh, arise, um, the, the arising of what surprises us and what's unexpected in the process of, of, of the making of the R, in the process of, of working in the meditation or with the imaginal relationship. And then there's the, the improvisation of responses to and the navigation of all that. And that includes the art of working with the energy body and the art of the different emphases and and leaning this way or that, more or less, that we discussed before. So all that is involved in the art and all that helps in relation to our doubts and uh, kind of unsurenesses uh, with regard to all this. Understanding the conceptual framework, as I said, functions as a kind of, uh, to, gives context, gives support, like that trellis in the rose garden. Yeah, giving support to what wants to flower. And out of that conceptual framework, it frames and, and gives rise to, helps to shape and direct our intentions, which helps so much. Because the intention is for soul making, for the. Uh, the increase of the sense of the sacredness, the widening of the sense of sacredness, the diversity of the sense of the sacredness, for the perceptions of the the other subtle dimensions, for subtle discernments, sensitivity, all these intentions are given, if you like, are um, determined or or handed to us by the conceptual framework that we're um, developing. So all that really helps. But discernment, uh, you know, discernment is is so key. Um, So, for example, regarding um, the discernment between just what we're calling desire, what we're calling craving, what we're calling eros, and the various responses there. Discernment and response, response responsibility. All that's really important. What is 
the appropriate or right or necessary order uh, for you. Now at this stage in your practice, in your life, what's the necessary order of <coughs> practice development uh, with regard to what we're calling craving, with regard to what we were calling clinging in its relationship to that deep investigation into emptiness, and that whole uh, un- 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 revealing of the deep dep- meaning of dependent origination. Uh, and 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 with eros, so just even just with those the with craving, um, the exploration of what we're calling clinging and what we're calling eros. What's the order necessary for you, your soul's calling? You know, isn't it? Just discerning that is not always uh, so easy, and and. I don't want to shove it into a formula. You have to do this before you do that. I don't think souls fit in uh, in formulae so easily at all. <clears throat> but if we want to explore uh, making a little more finer distinctions, uh, discernments here. So, um, for instance, between... Um, eros and or, or the question of eros in relationship to resting and also in relationship to jhana practice and in relation to metta practice so some of this we'll revisit but I just want to say a little bit about this now and get a sense of um, how, the, how the discernment can go even deeper so human beings you know um, we need uh, to discharge if you like, if we're kind of like energetic systems, sometimes we need to discharge um, after we've been charged up. Even when, when, certainly when the charge is just stress, you know, but, um, uh, but when, even when the charge is wholesome, some creative endeavor or inspiration that comes through us or a uh, beautiful kind of electricity of the being, flame of the being that's there at times, um, uh, you know, there's a charge there, and and the system needs to discharge uh, often or usually. And so there's, you know, we rest. We find different ways to rest. Now, what's the relationship between rest and eros? Because we can rest um, with or without the erotic imaginal. So perhaps more often we are uh, accustomed to a resting, a going to sleep that's a kind of a wanting to turn the world off. It's a vibhava tanha, um, the kind of craving for non-being, if you like, that uh, we talked about in some of the first talks. There's not the interest alive there. I just want to basically yeah, go into a kind of n- n- uh, not engaging mode. And there's not the interest, there's no image alive there. There's nothing imaginal. And there's no soul making or eros there because there's no image. No aliveness there, um, really. And we just want it to rest, to turn off. Um, Other times are probably more rare, but really, uh, you know, available to us is a kind of resting where we're still in relationship with... Um, the imaginal, either the intrapsychic imaginal uh, out there, or or um, the imaginal perception, the fullness of of the imaginal perception of something or someone in the actual world. Um, and there, where, where there's the eros there in in the imagination, it's in relationship, and sometimes there can be with that kind of resting. Um, a really beautiful, pervasive blessedness at the same time as resting. And here, actually, because the erotic imaginal are involved, the, the, the self, the sense of the self, the image of the self, the other, the world, the eros itself, it, all these four in that co-constellation are alive, multi-dimensional as images. They're alive as images. Uh, and and then they have that multi-dimensionality and perhaps even the, the sense of divinity that comes with that uh, as the, as the dimensionality gets kind of uh, richer and deeper. The eros psyche logos dynamic is alive there. It is um, 
working and moving, and there's rest. And and usually then the, the rest feels very, uh, so there's a real quality of beauty and, and blessedness at the same. So it's perhaps rarer, but really available. Again, can we discern uh, the difference there? Sometimes in regard to rest, you know, what we want um, is, is, is we want to be kind of, we want a coziness. Uh, so we want to be cosy. And that's quite an interesting one, uh, perhaps, or relatively speaking. Um, is is the imaginal operating there with this desire that we have when, when we want to kind of be cosy and rest? <clears throat> um, is that what I just referred to, this kind of resting in relationship with the erotic imaginal, where there's the blessedness and the aliveness of the multidimensionality? Um, some of you will know the, uh, the, what are they called, celestial seasonings tea. Celestial seasonings teas, yeah, they make different flavors of teas. And there's one, I don't know if they still make it, um, there's one called um, sleepy time tea. And on the on the box, the cardboard box for it, I can't re- uh, remember, I think I remember, um, there's a, a, a sort of drawing picture of a, a, a cute teddy bear dozing in an old armchair in his, um, what are those things called, sleeping gowns or frocks or whatever they're called, like those old-fashioned things that people used to sleep in, um, and a sort of floppy sleeping, sleeping hat. And he's by the fire in his living room, uh, in his snug, I learned that new word because I have one, uh, in, my, in, in the cottage that I'm writing. <laughs> a snug is a, is a little old-fashioned, um, living room with with a fireplace and sort of armchairs and it's sort of little and and the whole idea is that it's snug it's cozy. Um, actually, the one I have is is completely freezing and drafty, so I don't even sit in there. But but that's the that's the idea. So he's he's in this uh, old armchair dozing um, in his sleeping sleeping gown and floppy sleeping hat by the fire. And so okay, well there's an image. There's the image on the on the uh, box of the tea. And uh, it has a certain attractiveness to us. But is that, uh, or I would say it's not an image for us, unless there's the eros, unless there's this sense, as I said, of dimensionality, multidimensionality, unless there's a sense of it um, in opening to a kind of sense of sacredness or divinity, unless the eros, psyche, logos, the soul-making dynamic is aroused, ignited, uh, inseminating each other, and uh, there's an interest in in the image and in the uh, images of self, other world, and eros in the constellation. Now, that image, that kind of image of coziness, may be an imaginal image, may be an image in the sense that we're talking about. Um, but in the discernment, the question is: Is it? in this moment, for you? Is it that? Is it really imaginal in the way that we're talking about it? Or is it just an image in the in the um, flat or cheaper sense, if you like, that, that is in, in common parlance? And, and, and of course, you know, even if uh, it's not an image, it may still have its place in our life, you know. Uh, that's fine. But we're talking about the, the, the discernment, like, when is it eros? When is it imaginal? When is it not? More interesting than that is the whole question of um, what's present and what's involved in states of jhana or states of less fabrication where there's a lot of letting go, a lot of reduction in clinging and, for example, where resting in awareness or resting in a vastness of awareness or in a state of just kind of uh, so-called, just receiving, etc. Any of those states of less fabrication or states of jhana, the progressive states of jhana, are actually states of less fabrication. This is actually more interesting uh, with regard to eros. So there's there's a kind of rest in, in these states, but they're very alive as well. Uh, so this is this is quite interesting in relation to eros. It's uh, quite interesting. We'll say p- maybe more about it as as we go on. In themselves, is there such a thing as in themselves? Is there such a thing as anything in itself? No, there isn't. 
because of emptiness and dependent origination. Um, but for the sake of what we want to just draw out right now, let's just go along with this idea. In themselves, these states are only soul-making in, in a quite limited way. Why? Because they involve actually a quietening of image. Uh, you, you understand? There's le- jhana, etc., uh, states of these less fabrication, everything, all perception and ima- both perception and imaginal perception are, are getting less. So um, they, there's a quietening of the imaginal faculty, among other things. Um, and although the, the kind of the series of, let's say, jhanas or states of less fabrication, although it moves on, so there's something beyond this state until a certain point, um, there's something beyond this state, each state by itself it doesn't have an unfathomability, a sense of unfathomability of meaningfulness. It might have another kind of unfathomability. So I actually think jhanas are unfathomable in, in quite specific ways. Um, uh, for instance, the degree of concentration uh, is is kind of like, you know, it, it, it's in a way it's infinitely, um, it's infinitely increasable in any jhana. Sometimes people, yeah, anyway. Um, but But there's not this sense of, in each state by itself, in each jhana, or in each state of unf- relative unfabrication, there's not a sense in that state of the unfathomability of meaningfulness within the state. So this is quite interesting. So what does that mean in terms of the eros and the imaginal? Um, it means there's, a, as I said, a limited kind of soul-making um, involved in those states. Now, part or a dimension of the soul, or at least what I would like to to think of now as 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 a dimension of the soul, um, there is a dimension of the soul that loves and desires to know uh, oneness that comes with those different states, different kinds of oneness, and desires transcendence and desires the unfabricated, and that dimension of the soul is is of course very nourished by these states. But the dimension of the soul that we've more been talking about so far um, is only nourished and supported by uh, these states um, and is only involved with the practice of the jhanas or these states of less fabrication through the fantasies and conceptual frameworks that um, are in place around or are involved in the experiences. These fantasies and conceptual frameworks may support the soul-making dynamic, the um, <clears throat> again the ignition, the insemination, the expansion, uh, and enrichment of the eros psyche logos dynamic. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an important distinction. Um, so, for example, when there's PT or rapture, bliss, and the first or second jhana, say, or something, a person might interpret it as in a, in a certain context without a certain teaching or with a certain teaching around the whole experience because you don't have to be a Buddhist to go into the first or second jhana it's like these are just human experiences uh, but a person might say this this experience this experience of total bliss and rapture and white light or you know um, this this was or is or was God making love to me making love to my soul. There's a certain concept and fantasy image of the experience. Um, or a person might say that was that experience of the first or second jhana or that, that bliss, that rapture was my participation in, I entered into a consciousness of my participation. Mind and body uh, were conscious of participating or more fully participating in the divine or the cosmic satchitananda to borrow from another tradition uh, being consciousness bliss of um, of some of the Indian traditions that they talk about now neither of those, God making love to my soul or my participating in the divine uh, being consciousness bliss satchitananda um, it, neither of those is a classical uh, ideas, uh, Buddhist ideas, of course. What's probably m- much more uh, likely within a 
Buddhist framework and a Buddhist sort of stream of teaching is um, the sense of like, wow, not only was that really amazing and pleasant and beautiful in its way, but I am experiencing what the Buddha described. Come out of this jhana the first or second, go through these jhanas, you know, however many, and there's really a sense of, wow, that really matches his description. I, I am now experiencing what the Buddha taught and described uh, thousands of years ago. I am... I feel myself walking the path of the elders, walking um, in the path of the tradition. Um, and this can be such a beautiful feeling um, and such a striking sense. But there's a fa- there are fantasies wrapped up in that. Fantasies of tradition, fantasies of self. Uh, and I'm, I'm using this word in a good sense, fantasy. Fantasies of tradition, fantasies of self, fantasies of awakening, moving towards awakening, on the path towards awakening, fantasies of the Dharma, all all that. Um, So the soul-making, in the way that we've been talking about it, comes in the fantasies, in the concepts around the experience of the quietening of the uh, perception, the unfabricating, the jhana, the quietening of the imaginal. And also in the, in the longing to know, uh, to attain and experience um, these states that are beyond those states that are beyond what I already know. So they kind of live in my imagination as a beyond for the pothos to kind of want more of. Uh, the, the very beyondness creates an eros, and in relation to them and the self and the tradition and all of that, there is this uh, erotic imaginal connection. But it's in the fantasy and the concept around, for the most part, the kind of soul making that we've mostly been talking about on this on these retreats. What about, uh, to make another discernment, just to draw out the the subtleties of discernment here, what about um, the experience, for example, of resting in the lap of the Buddha, or resting in in Grandma's love? Remember when we did, if you were there at the Re-Enchanting the Cosmos retreat, and we did the the exercise at the beginning with the imaginal figure of love, what's we called it, the imaginal figure of love. And some people probably um, chose a figure uh, for example, like Grandmarks, uh, which we talked about a little later, and Catherine and Nick sang that beautiful Bill Withers song about Grandma's hands. So, when I'm resting <clears throat> in the lap of the Buddha, so to speak, or in Grandma's love, um, is that or is that not uh, the imaginal? And is that Eros? So there's plenty of love there. There's certainly the use of the imagination, grandma, or this imaginal figure, whether it's grandma, grandpa, whatever, and there's the Buddha and, you know, whatever. So there's the use of the imagination. But if grandma, um, or wh- whoever it is in the image, if this uh, figure of the imagination which, um, represents <coughs> simply metta, or simply unconditional love, that's that's actually great and lovely and can be really really helpful and important but if i'm not if it's only that and i'm not deeply interested in grandma if i really want only the feelings of warmth the feelings of comfort of coziness of security or if i just want the quality of meta then then this will not be this figure of the imagination will not be soul making will not be imaginal because there's not the eros there I'm not deeply interested in them it won't stimulate the eros psyche logos dynamic or that it will stimulate it only to a very limited degree grandma or in the Buddha or whatever it is uh, in that in that instance is not for me an erotic object Remember, erotic doesn't need to be sexual, but she's not an erotic object in the sense that um, that has this w- unfathomability of wanting more, of discovering, uh, of enriching, complicating through the eros psyche logos dynamic. Um, there's not an aliveness and uh, arousal um, of the interest um, 
in her and her depths, if you like, her dimensionality. There's not the sense of the divinity there. It's very sweet, it's very lovely, it's very helpful. There's not the divinity, the unfathomability, the mystery uh, that one finds in... I don't find that in her, those, those aspects, those dimensions. M- maybe, you know, if, with Grandma or with the Buddha in that kind of f- flatter way, we want to sleep a bit and just sleep and rest in in that kind of love, in that kind of comfort and security. And um, that can be really okay, really okay, but it's not soul-making. Yeah, so just to make this discernment, it can be really okay, and it may be actually necessary sometimes, perhaps at certain stages in our life, um, or certain stages in our practice, it may be really necessary, but it's not soul-making. Or it may be that we're relating to it because we, we're actually using it in a certain way uh, to get in. We're using this um, imaginary figure, uh, figure of the imagination, to get in touch with, for instance, the quality of, of meta or a certain degree of meta. And then we actually forget them. We forget grandma. Grandma, in that case, is just a springboard, a kind of touchstone for uh, towards or for, for a quality of meta. So it's skillful. You use that, you get the quality, and then you can forget grandma. Um, great, skillful. It, it's a, it's a, as I said, a springboard, a, a touchstone into the quality of meta. But the soul making then will be limited. Yeah, it will be limited soul making because it doesn't have this uh, interest in her and her unfathomability, her dimensionality, and her depths. So, if um, I'm primarily, if at any time, I'm primarily looking for pleasure, or for rest in, in this sense, or, or just for the quality of metta, or if the self and the other, the images of self and other are too concrete and not unfathomable, um, as images are, in the sense that we're using them, not unfathomable, they're too concrete, um, then at best, in those cases, uh, the soul-making will be very limited and the opening and the um, expansion and the fecundity of the soul-making dynamic of the eros psyche logos together uh, working together will, will be very limited. So there's all, all kinds of discernments uh, that I, I think are important um, as we as we sort of develop these practices, develop our range and go into this territory. Um, you know, another discernment, another thing to notice is where, uh, for you, um, where is the imaginal, the soul-making, the erotic imaginal alive, and where it is not, where is it not alive. So, for example, some people um, in meditation, or with respect to meditation practice, there's actually very little eros. There's very little kind of arousal of interest, maybe in general, but there's there's very little um, in the way of images, imaginal images of self, other, world, eros, alive with respect to or in meditation. Whereas in in uh, some relationships in their life or some actions in their life, um, all that is alive. The interest, the Im- 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 images of self, other, world, eros are alive there and soul-making, maybe in relation to service or maybe in relation to activism or in relation to one of those but not the other, perhaps service but not activism, activism but not service, could be, could be or anything, you know. Uh, whereas in practice, in formal practice, actually, that there's very little eros there. Other people, it might be the other way around, that the eros and the soul-making is um, alive in and with respect to meditation practice, but in actual life, um, there seems it's harder for... Uh, to, to be uh, suffused with the imaginal, to be impregnated with the imaginal. Harder for life to become imaginal uh, in, that percep- in our perception. Harder for soul-making in life, in, in activity, in relation to the world, uh, more widely. Now, either of those two uh, types or categories, if you like, uh, either the one who has the soul-making um, 
in the world but not in the meditation, or the other who has the soul making in the meditation but not so much in the world and activity. You know, very easily when when there's something's not working in my practice, and and very easily one of the um, sort of answers that a person gives themselves is, I need more concentration. I need more samadhi. Uh, so maybe, maybe that's what needs to happen in your practice to open it out, to make it more potent, etc. Uh, more, more widespread, pervasive in its potency and deeper. Maybe that's maybe that's really what you need more concentration. But maybe, maybe not. And again, just a sort of little footnote here. Please hear all these teachings in context. Um, you know, I'm I'm a little bit addressing common assumptions that I meet as a teacher um, at the same time as probably, you know, I don't know, a, a good proportion of my teaching over the years has been uh, it, it, teaching samadhi, teaching jhanas, and really helping people develop that art and the mastery there and go deeper and deeper through the jhanas. Um, so please take this right now in, in context. Um, but oftentimes people have this thought, it's always, I need more concentration, I need more focus, etc. It, it might be that's what needs to happen, or it might be actually that what needs to happen is the imaginal needs to be released, there needs to be more um, suffusion and more uh, fullness and opening of and opening to the imaginal a wider, deeper, imaginal sense, igniting, involving eros, um, the interest, the um, eros-psyche-logos dynamic and soul-making. Maybe that's what needs to happen. That's So somehow I need to find, allow it to spread to the areas where it isn't. Or it might be that the kinds of images and fantasies that are operating are too restricted too narrow you know so again could be many many examples here and I've given in the past in relation to engagement or whatever it is or or also in relation to actual meditation many many possibilities but for example and just one I mentioned you know sometimes it's very understandable with some people because of what they've been through and everything um, that they tend to look to meditation um, for rest for some degree of um, you know, comfort and yeah, even coziness or a sense of safety, and um, that can be very understandable, um, and and you know, quite important sometimes. Um, but maybe you know, uh, a person is also has been in that and actually got stuck in a in a narrow range of image in relation to to meditation and practice. And that's what needs to expand, is the imaginal range to, for instance, include images and fantasies of of struggle, of courage, of putting up with difficulties. Uh, The fantasies of nobility, the nobility of courage, the nobility of being able to sit through the fire, through the struggle, through the difficulty, the, the nobility of the, the soul's willingness to do that, the self's willingness to do that, the beauty of that. Sometimes that whole deme- range of fantasy is missing in a person. They just don't have uh, that, that there. And, and without these, there's a kind of, uh, you know, with all the best intentions, there's a kind of flaccidity in in. in, in in their practice. They keep, somehow, something keeps collapsing because it doesn't have the imaginal support, doesn't have the filling out of the beauty of the fantasy that would allow one to sit through the difficulty. It's not rendered beautiful. Uh, the courage is it's not given this um, nobility through the beauty of the fantasy and the richness of the fantasy. There's a caving in again and again. Something collapses. Something just stops practice, you just stop practice, turn away from the difficult, always um, looking every time for what's easy, for what's comfortable, because there isn't the imaginal support for something else, for a different relationship. And if we do that every time, that has massive consequences in terms of the kind of um, patterns it sets up. in, in, in certainly in meditation, but also then in one's life, you know, massive consequences. So that's just one example. Could give m- many and quite opposite ones, and do, do, you know, whatever. 
Uh, but really this discernment and noticing where the eros, the, the imaginal, the soul-making is alive for us and working beautifully and potent and uh, impregnating and where it's not. Yeah? And it's, it's uh, you know, for us to look and, and see in our lives. And related to that, of course, is is the is the uh, is the discernment and and the noticing. What do I really desire? What do I really want? What is it that I long for? So, do I even allow my being to have deep longing? Does that you know? This is an interesting question. And we'll come back to this. Um, but there's the discernment of what do I long for? You know. And then there's also discernment if if I can let myself feel at times the deep longing of my soul. Um, There's a discernment within the longing as well, which is quite interesting. You know, deep, intense longing has this bittersweet quality, uh, sometimes hard to bear, and yet also has a great beauty in it. Um, But that's longing, it's a desire for me. I want this, my soul yearns for this. But wrapped up in the very longing is another aspect. It's telling me about what I'm devoted to. It's telling me about what I want, what I serve already, or what I want to serve. You understand? The longing is telling me what I'm devoted to. It's not just it's for me, but it's telling me what I'm devoted to, what I serve or what I want to serve. And so the longing, the experience of longing, if we can bear it and open to it and even nourish it, um, can help us uh, discern uh, what, what we want to serve through my longing, through my deep desire. It's telling me something, it's guiding me. So with the longing, there's, there's both important aspects. What do I want for me, for this, this soul wants something for itself, and it's telling me about what I want to serve. They're, they're facets, if you like, to discern between two facets of the same current, the same deep current, deep movement of longing. And again, you know, in relation to all this and the doubt that arises, and, and um, so I'm saying, why, why is this important? Um, why is this thing about longing important? Well, it, it's exactly, it's what matters most deeply to us. It's almost a definition of, of importance. It's what matters most deeply to us. You know, and it matters to make these discernments. Craving it matters to discern what is craving. Cra- you know, if I, if I don't, if I'm not conscious of craving, if craving gains in power in the way that we're using it, you know what happens? I end up squandering m- my energy. I end up squandering the treasures I've been giving. I end up dissipating uh, my soul, if you like, my chitta, the, the energy, the strength, the coherence of it the beauty of it, the gift of it. I squander and dissipate in the end. I squander and dissipate my life and my soul through craving. And the discernment of what we mean by clinging and the exploration of all that, why is that important? Uh, Because through that I can really understand something profound, radical, utterly surprising in a way that opens up the whole sense of existence. That's important. It's important to know what matters most deeply to to the soul, the longing. It's important to know what is craving and therefore squandering or dissipating one's life. It's important if if it's given too much, uh, you know, leeway and power. It's important to investigate clinging because of the 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 jewel of, 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 of the Dharma and the teaching of dependent origination, emptiness, and what that can open for us. And it's important to discern eros because it brings soul-making. And soul-making is what the soul needs, what the soul loves. Soul-making is what the soul needs and loves. And soul-making needs eros. Uh, or souls to different degrees, let's say, need 
eros and soul making, more or less. We'll say more about that later. But it already exists. Eros and soul making in our life already exists. Uh, we need to acknowledge, it's important to acknowledge it, to see it, to discern, to see that it's different from craving or just any old desire or, or whatever. To understand its movement and to care for it. So it's important to dis- make these discernments, to be clear and to care for what serves what opens beauty, what opens a sense of the sacred. 